if you don't tell me that this means war, if you still try to defend the infamies and horrors perpetrated by that Antichrist, I really believe he is Antichrist, I will have nothing more to do with you, and you are no longer my friend, no longer my faithful slave, as you call yourself. But how do you do? I see I have frightened you. Sit down and tell me all the news. It was in July 1805, and the speaker was a well-known Anna Pavlovna Schere, maid of honor and the favorite of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. With these words she greeted Prince Vasily Kuragin, a man of high rank and importance, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had had a cough for some days. She was, as she said, suffering from la grippe, grippe being then a new word in St. Petersburg, only used by the elite. All her invitations, without exception written in French and delivered by a scarlet-livered footman that morning, ran as follows. If you have nothing better to do, count or prince, and if the prospect of spending an evening with a poor invalid is not too terrible, I shall be very charmed to see you tonight between seven and ten. Annette Scherer Heavens, what a violent attack, replied the prince, not in the least disconcerted by this reception. He had just entered, wearing an embroidered court uniform, knee breeches and shoes, and had stars on his breast and a serene expression on his flat face. He spoke in that refined French in which our grandfathers not only spoke but thought, and with a gentle patronizing intonation natural to a man of importance who had grown old in society and at court. He went up to Anna Pavlovna, kissed her hand, presenting to her his bold, scented and shining head, and complacently seated himself on the sofa. First of all, dear friend, tell me how you are. Set your friend's mind at rest, he said without altering his tone, beneath the politeness and affected sympathy of which indifference and even irony could be discerned. Can one be well while suffering morally? Can one be calm in times like these if one has any feelings? said Anna Pavlovna. You are staying the whole evening, I hope. And the feet at the English ambassadors? Today is Wednesday. I must put in an appearance there, said the prince. My daughter is coming for me to take me there. I thought today's feat had been cancelled. I confess, all these festivities and fireworks are becoming wearisome. If they had known that you wished it, the entertainment would have been put off, said the prince, who, like a wound-up clock, by force of habit, said things he did not even wish to be believed. Don't tease. Well, and what has been decided about Navazilkia's dispatch? You know everything. What can one say about it? replied the prince in a cold, listless tone. What has been decided? They have decided that Bonaparte has burned his boats, and I believe that we are ready to burn ours. Prince Vasily always spoke languidly, like an actor repeating a stale part. Anna Pavlovna Shera, on the contrary, despite her forty years, overflowed with animation and impulsiveness. To be an enthusiast has become her social vocation, and sometimes, even when she did not feel like it, she became enthusiastic in order not to disappoint the expectation of those who knew her. The subdued smile, which, though it did not suit her faded features, always played round her lips, expressed as in a spoiled child, a continual consciousness of her charming defect, which she neither wished nor could, not considered it necessary, to correct. In the midst of a conversation on political matters, Anna Pavlovna burst out. Oh, don't speak to me of Austria. Perhaps I don't understand things, but Austria never has wished and does not wish for war. She is betraying us. Russia alone must save Europe. Our gracious sovereign recognizes his high vocation and will be true to it. That is the one thing I have faith in. Our good and wonderful sovereign has to perform the noblest role on earth, and he is so virtuous and noble that God will not forsake him.
He will fulfill his vocation and crush the Hydra of revolution, which has become more terrible than ever in the person of this murderer and villain. We alone must avenge the blood of the just one, whom, I ask you, can we rely on? England, with her commercial spirit, will not and cannot understand the Emperor Alexander's loftiness and soul. She has refused to evacuate Malta. She wanted to find, and still seeks, some secret motive in our actions. What answer did Novosiltiev get? None. The English have not understood, and cannot understand, the self-abnegation of our Emperor, who wants nothing for himself, but only desires the good of mankind. And what have they promised? Nothing. And what little they have promised they will not perform. Prussia has always declared that Bonaparte is invincible, and that all Europe is powerless before him. And I don't believe a word that Hardenburg says, or Haugwitz either. This famous Prussian neutrality is just a trap. I have faith only in God and the lofty destiny of our adored monarch. He will save Europe. She suddenly paused, smiling at her own impetuosity. I think that the prince was a smile, that if you have been sent, instead of our dear Winzigerod, you would have captured the king of Prussia's consent by assault. You are so eloquent. Will you give me a cup of tea? In a moment. Apropos, she added, becoming calm again. I am expecting two very interesting men tonight, Le Vicomte de Mortemar, who is connected with the Montmorencis through the Rohans, one of the best French families. He is one of the genuine émigrés, the good ones, and also the Abbe Moriot. Do you know the profound thinker? He has been received by the Emperor, had you heard? I shall be delighted to meet them, said the Prince. But tell me, he added with a studied carelessness, as if it had only just occurred to him, though the question he was about to ask was the chief motive of his visit. Is it true that the Dovanger Empress wants Baron Funke to be appointed first secretary at Vienna? The Baron, by all accounts, is a poor creature. Prince Vasili wished to obtain this post for his son but others were trying through the Dovanger Empress Maria Fyodorovna to secure it for the Baron. Anna Pavlovna almost closed her eyes to indicate that neither she nor anyone else had a right to criticize what the Empress desired or was pleased with. Baron Funke had been recommended to the Dovanger Empress by her sister, was all she said in a dry and mournful tone. As she named the Empress, Anna Pavlovna's face suddenly assumed an expression of profound and sincere devotion and respect mingled with sadness, and this occurred every time she mentioned her illustrious patroness. She added that Her Majesty had designed to show Baron Funke Bucor de Steam, and again her face clouded over with sadness. The prince was silent and looked indifferent, but with a womanly and courtier-like quickness and tact Habitual to her, Anna Pavlovna wished both to rebuke him. For daring to speak, he had done of a man recommended to the Empress, and at the same time to console him. So she said, Now about your family. Do you know that since your daughter came out, everyone has been enraptured by her? They say she is amazingly beautiful. The prince bowed to signify his respect and gratitude. I often think, she continued after a short pause, drawing nearer to the prince and smiling amiably at him as if to show that political and social topics were ended and the time had come for intimate conversation. I often think how unfairly sometimes the joys of life are distributed. Why has fate given you two such splendid children? I don't speak of Anatole, your youngest. I don't like him she added in a tone admitting of no rejoinder and raising her eyebrows. Two such charming children, and really you appreciate them less than anyone, and so you don't deserve to have them. And she smiled her ecstatic smile. I can't help it, said the prince. 
Lavater would have said I lack the bump of paternity.